Hey guys, thank you uh, for everybody joining uh, on Zoom and in person. Uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Eric Steinbach, who is an assistant professor uh, on the tenure track in the Department of Allergy and Immunology. Aaron has been at UNC uh, for just about as long as I've been at UNC. Um, she is a graduate of the PSTB uh, training program and completed her residency and her internal medicine and fellowship here at UNC in allergy immunology. And then um, was also part of our T32 uh, basic science training program, during which uh, she was successful in obtaining uh, a center pilot feasibility study grant, as well as a PSTP uh, fellows award. She subsequently followed that up with uh, an award uh, by the PSTP program, which was a faculty, a junior faculty development grant. And she now currently has her care work being reviewed in the next couple of months. Erin's um, focus has been on um, understanding the role of the gut barrier in, in food allergy, in particular peanut allergy. And uh, her paper just got accepted last week. So we're all excited about hearing that. Thank you, Erin. Thank you. All right. I'm excited to talk here. Can people on Zoom see me if I stand on this side? They won't. No, they won't leave me, period. If yes, we can see you. Thing up. Okay. All right. So we'll just get started. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. It's a small group in person, but I always appreciate seeing faces in person. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of my more recent uh, research um, in revealing mechanisms of intestinal epithelial cell barrier dysfunction and peanut allergy. And I wanted to just say at the very beginning that uh, when I say peanut or food allergy, I am specifically talking about an IgE mediated allergy mechanism um, in the sense of a type one hypersensitivity reaction. So we know there are other types of allergic food allergies like eosinophilic esophagitis, which this group is very familiar with um, that don't really fit into this category. And so um, this is a very specific type of food allergy that I'm talking about today. All right, so I wanted to start out by reviewing um, how peanut allergy or food allergy develops because it's a little bit different, although generally similar to uh, other inflammatory responses. Um, so the first time someone is exposed to allergen, the process of sensitization occurs. It's much like other immune responses where the antigen presenting cells take up the antigen, they process it, and then they present it via the MHC class two to T cells. And when the right T cell comes along, they recognize the antigen in the context of MHC. And they, uh, along with the help of local cytokines and other signals, will uh, start to differentiate into a mature TH2 type cell. So these cells start producing cytokines, uh, particular with a TH2 response, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, um, which then signal to B cells, which also recognize this allergen to produce peanut-specific IgE antibody. So to isotype switch to IgE, this antibody then circulates throughout the body and will then decorate mast cells in various tissues, um, in particular mucosal tissues, um, and sort of hang out there and wait for when it may recognize it, uh, this allergen. So then once this immune response de develops and the person is exposed to an allergen again, peanut allergens are absorbed into the system and gain access to the host immune response. Uh, immune system, and the peanut allergen then is recognized by the antibodies on the mast cells, which if there are enough of them and the interaction is strong enough, they will cross-link the receptors on the mast cell surface, leading to the degranulation of mast cells and release a bunch of different mediators that cause this allergic immune response, both, both 
um, shown by local symptoms and systemic symptoms here. So you can see here that we know a lot of the nitty gritty about how the immune response develops in an allergy, um, but other components contributing to the allergic immune response are less well understood. I'll talk about later. Just a little background um, for general IgE food allergy. It's also often develops in the first two years of life. The prevalence um, is highest at uh, year one with an estimated six to eight percent of children affected. Certain allergies are more likely to be outgrown like cow's milk and hen's egg allergy. Um, with, uh, for instance, for kids between ages 16, 14 and 16, nearly 70 to 80 percent of kids will outgrow these allergies by that age. So in the U.S., food allergy prevalence in children has been growing, and at, it has in adults as well. Cow's milk is the number one food allergy in infants and young children, and there's some debate about whether being able to eat these foods baked um, in different contexts will have kids outgrow these allergies sooner. In adults, the picture is a little different. Oral allergy syndrome is actually the most common adult food allergy um, with a prevalence around 10%. And uh, the most common perpetrator of allergic reactions in adults is seafood and peanut and tree nuts. So to manage IgE-mediated food allergy, we have very few options at this point. Um, there's no cure for food allergy, but our main approach is to completely avoid exposure to the food, which can be tough. We do this by educating the patient um, to read food labels, to know sort of other words that mean that food. For instance, casein is another word for uh, protein in cow's milk that can cause a reaction. Um, to be able to identify things that may make their allergic reaction worse, um, like exercising really vigorously or drinking alcohol or being sick. Um, so we try to educate them as much as we can. Um, we also try to treat their other allergic diseases um, and kind of optimize management of those comorbidities. Um, teach them about how to use their EpiPen if they have a reaction. Um, lately, we've learned a lot more about the psychosocial uh, effects of peanut allergy and food allergy. And so we screen for bullying and other mood disorders, which are highly prevalent in these patients. And then we do have some new therapies that have entered the market recently, um, which the idea is not a cure for these food allergies, but to create a little bit of a barrier for the threshold amount of food that is going to induce a reaction. So give, give the kids, give the patients a little cushion before they would have a reaction. So overall, this is not really great in how we manage food allergy. Um, and I think that's a big part of why it causes such um, such a big, has just such a big effect on the quality of life in patients. So why do I care about peanut allergy? It's the most often cause of fatal food associated anaphylaxis. Um, and, oh, lost my notes for a second here. <laughs> um, so it's still really like vanishingly rare to die from a food induced anaphylaxis it's like on the order of being uh, hit with lightning. So super, super rare. But when it does happen, peanut is the most common cause. And so if we study the uh, pathogenesis of the allergen, we can maybe better understand why it's so good at inducing really severe reactions. Um, so this allergy is commonly not outgrown. So typically lasts the whole life of the patient. So they're gonna be dealing with this as a chronic disease, persistent to adulthood. Um, and the her heritability of peanut allergy is actually 
really, really high. So um, the, the genetic association is about 80%, um, which is higher than Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, I believe. So it's highly associated with genetics. And so that has allowed us to identify different genome-wide association studies um, with single nuclear nucleotide polymorphisms that are disproportionately associated with allergy. Um, we've also been able to identify certain gene mutations that are more prevalent in certain populations that are associated with, um, for instance, atopic dermatitis, and then a higher risk of developing food allergy. Have they looked at monozygotic twins? That's a good question. Um, I, feel like they have, but I don't remember what they found because the, the genetic inheritance is so high yeah. anyway. It can be strong in like Crohn's disease too, but mm -hmm. psychotic twins are discordant. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's still, you know, incompletely understood definitely how genetics contributes to disease. Um, and then the last part is that a lot of studies are now trying to um, kind of categorize patients and characterize patients to try to get a more homogeneous population so that we can study something that's more likely to be a similar disease process or pathogenesis and then understand that mechanism to pathogenesis better. Um, so we're, we're understanding kind of who may be at higher risk for having a severe reaction, who might react to lower doses of peanut, who might benefit from early introduction of peanut. And so that's, those are all reasons why um, studying peanut allergy is, um, I think, a good route to go. Um, I'll briefly talk about um, mouse models in peanut allergy. So the main uh, point of these next two slides are that there are lots of different models of peanut allergy in mice. And there are tons of variations you can have with each of these models. So here you can have uh, exposure to peanut with or without adjuvant, which is uh, a component that will boost the allergic immune response to that, to that protein. Um, there are some genetically modified mice, for instance, the IL-4 receptor F709 mouse that uh, produces more IL-4 um, or has a mutation in the IL-4 receptor where it's active. And so it has more signaling through the IL-4 receptor and that is associated with uh, food allergy. Um, so there are lots of different models to start out with. And then when we're actually looking at the mode of developing peanut allergy, you have these different parts of peanut allergy. So you have sensitization, uh, the oral challenge where they have an allergic reaction and how you measure that, which can all be different as well. So the route of sensitization, how frequent they're sensitized, um, how long the sensitization period can all be different. And then the route of challenge, how often they're challenged and what their readout is. And then there's lots of routes that we can expose mice to allergen. So in the skin, through the nose, so kind of through the nasopharynx and lungs, um, in the GI tract, and just by um, giving an interperitoneal or even intravenous. So it makes it very difficult to kind of compare across studies and identify common problems or common uh, pathogenic mechanisms of food allergy. So I was really excited when the CC27 mouse model of peanut allergy was identified. So Dr. Burke's group um, used the collaborative cross, which is this, um, it's a, a global effort to provide inbred mouse strains with precise genetic variation, all stemming from an original eight founder mice. So, um, and by, they're made by differential breeding. So you have all these different populations of inbred mice. So they're reproducible and you can buy them and breed them and they're, they maintain their genetic heterogeneity. Um, 
And the diversity across all of these populations more closely resembles the diversity of the human of humans. And so we can start to try to understand mechanisms of continuous traits or of complex genetic diseases. So uh, Dr. Burks took a subset of these mice and screened them for susceptibility to peanut allergy. The mice were exposed to peanut extract, um, which I'll just call peanut from here on out, um, with adjuvant orally once a week for four weeks. And then in the fifth week, they were challenged orally or intraperitoneally kind of as a control um, to peanut. And as a measure of systemic reaction during challenge, we measure rectal temperature immediately after the challenge with peanut and follow that over time. So through this screen, we were able to identify the CC27 mouse as reliably demonstrating these dramatic decreases in rectal temperature during oral challenge with peanut. So the next step of this process was to take the susceptible CC27 mouse and breed it with a non-susceptible or resistant mouse strain. Um, and the F2 progeny were then genotyped and phenotyped to identify regions of the genome that were associated with the peanut allergy phenotype. So from this, we were able to identify uh, about six to eight different very large sections of the genome that were associated with um, the, of the CC27 genome that were associated with susceptibility to peanut allergy. And this um, analysis, more fine mapping, is really complicated and it's still ongoing, um, but I won't delve into that more. Um, so uh, Dr. Burke's group showed that they're susceptible to peanut allergy by the oral route. Um, and we had a couple other interesting observations. So we were able to measure a component, a major um, uh, allergen of peanut, era H2, in the serum of mice after they were challenged with peanut. We found that CC27 had much higher levels of serum era H2 compared to the other strains of mice that were, were resistant to uh, allergy. And the serum ARH2 correlated really nicely with the degree of severity of reaction, which is shown by the maximum body temperature decrease here. So this suggests that the degree or the amount of intestinal allergen that crosses the intestinal epithelial cell barrier and circulates systemically may be how um, or may determine how severe a reaction is. And so intestinal permeability um, is something that I have been really interested in and how it relates to, to disease and specifically peanut allergy. So um, there was a study a while ago, 2006, a small group of peanut allergic patients um, had their intestinal permeability measure um, using the lactulose mannitol assay, uh, which diffuse across the intestinal barrier differently. And if you take the ratio of these metabolites in the urine, you get a sense of how permeable their intestinal barrier is kind of on a larger scale. And so a higher ratio means they have um, higher amounts of intestinal permeability. When they took these patients- With that in would that suggest that they have like an injured or inflamed intestine or just at natural homeostasis levels? So it's usually associated with some sort of perturbation, uh, whatever it may be. Um, so it could be like homeostasis for these people, but it's really hard. So they had increased permeability compared to normal control patients. So kind of this is baseline without eating peanut or other food allergens. Um, I don't know if there's like a normal level 
because this is only used in research. Um, that's been tested in lots of people, and we have a good idea of what that is. But it's not like they had a chronic inflammatory disease or something. No, 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 no. Just food allergy. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah. So when they were stratified by the grade of their reaction, so the higher, more to the right you go, the more severe the allergic reaction was. And you can see that those patients with the more severe reactions had a significantly elevated um, difference from control in their intestinal permeability, suggesting again that intestinal permeability may be a determinant of severity of reaction. So back to the CC27 mouse model of peanut allergy. Um, so you'll remember before when I was describing this model, um, the uh, Dr. Burke's group was using an adjuvant to induce allergy in this mouse. Um, and so they were really interested to see if this susceptibility was still there without the use of an adjuvant because um, we all don't know, most of these, this group should know, cholera toxin, which is the adjuvant we use, itself can alter uh, intestinal permeability and increase it. So we wanted to see what happened without the use of an adjuvant. So we used um, several different ways during sensitization of the mice to introduce peanut. Um, so PBS was just uh, non-sensitized mice, here. So I'll just briefly point out that even uh, non-sensitized mice who are challenged with peanut have a mild drop in their body temperature, suggesting this is like some intrinsic property of peanut that is inducing this response and may, be, may or may not be immunologically related. So when we compare this to the other modes of sensitization, um, we can see we all have dramatic responses in, um, in the mice that were sensitized with adjuvant and also without adjuvant with a stronger response, the more frequent peanut exposure occurred. So the red bar is the uh, mice that were given peanut three times a week without adjuvant. So this kind of set me up uh, to really have this model about had a genetic, some genetic susceptibility to peanut and did not have any exogenous uh, perturbations that were going to change intestinal permeability, like the cholera toxin. So uh, we know a lot of things about intestinal permeability. There's also a lot of things we don't know about it. Um, there are lots of normal ways for things to pass across the intestinal epithelial cell barrier. Um, and so the gut at baseline is a little bit leaky or a little bit permeable. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to absorb nutrients and you know, keep uh, the electrochemical gradient so, and maintain water balance. So this is a good thing. But we do know that it, with certain perturbations in the barrier, that more there's more passage of bacteria and antigens um, that can potentially disrupt the immune system and activate it and cause um, either chronic inflammatory diseases or food allergies. So there have been lots of studies, um, both in humans and in animal models and cell cultures, um, looking at intestinal permeability and how it's related to food allergy. And so to kind of summarize um, from all of these papers, uh, patients with food allergies tend to have increased baseline intestinal permeability. They also have increased intestinal permeability during an allergic reaction, which makes sense. And this permeability correlates with the reaction severity that they have. And there's also been um, some studies, usually in cell lines, so in vitro studies that have shown that peanut itself can directly affect the intestinal barrier and change the amount uh, and, um, and the location of tight junction proteins. So it seems to have maybe an immunological independent effect on the intestinal barrier. So we care about intestinal permeability. 
So back to the CC27 mouse model. Um, so mice are sensitized in the same way as before with uh, weekly exposure by oral gavage to peanut. In the fifth week, we challenge them with a marker Fitzy Dextran, uh, which is four kilodaltons large, and so has a very specific um, uh, ability to cross the intestinal barrier. And when we measure this in the serum by fluorescence, we can get a sense of how permeable the barrier is. Here. Mm -hmm. How is the challenge different from the sensitization? You give more of it. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And relatively, um, our model gives less protein, uh, food protein, than a lot of other models. So sensitization, we give two milligrams of peanut protein uh, for the first three weeks, and then five milligrams, kind of a boost. And then challenge, we give eight to twelve milligrams. Some some studies use like a hundred milligrams twice. <laughs> so. Uh, it's, it's a more sensitive model. Um, so when we measure um, plasma fitzidextran levels, uh, peanut, um, the peanut challenged mice, CC27 mice, showed significantly higher levels of the plasma fitzidextran. Um, and this correlated well with their change in rectal temperature as a measure of severity. So this is going along with what we see in humans. Um, I also sensitize mice to non-peanut food allergens using this um, same protocol. And when we looked at the serum specific IgE for these different foods, we saw significantly higher levels in the mice sensitized to peanut, walnut, and egg, but not milk. And uh, when we look at reactivity upon challenge. So again, we're looking at rectal temperature. These are mice not sensitized and not challenged. When we challenge with peanut, again, they have very reliable responses, uh, decreases in rectal temperature. Food lighting. <laughs> um, no response to uh, egg or milk. And although uh, we did see a, a slight increase in the amount of IgE that recognized walnut, they did have a mild, so um, a smaller response compared to peanut when they were challenged with walnut. And when we looked at the directly at the intestinal permeability of these mice, we saw that it actually decreased in mice cha challenged with milk and egg. Uh, and there's no difference in the mice given walnut, even though we saw kind of mild temperature decrease in these mice. Um, and when we measured the direct allergen, so one of the major allergens of these foods, so in milk it's FOS D5 and egg is GAL D2, we only were able to recover um, high allergen levels in the serum from peanut challenged mice. So again, suggesting that peanut is maybe specifically good at being absorbed systemically and causing a more severe reaction. Although a big caveat of this is that we don't know equivalent doses of these allergens. And so it's really hard to compare with the exact same protein amounts. Um, but still interesting nonetheless. Could it be that there would just be a different mouse strain that's more sensitive to different allergens? That's possible, for sure. Um, you know, we're always thinking about what the microbiome does. So if there's a specific microbial interaction that may, uh, I don't know, like process a food allergen a certain way, um, that it affects the barrier. Yeah. So something we're always thinking about. Question. Were the genes that you found or, or whoever found with the QTL mapping, were mm -hmm. they involved in intestinal homeostasis? Like so, so these these are like 10 mega base pair sections. So they're huge. So they haven't whittled that down quite right. yet. We have not. But in maybe I probably won't have time to talk about it, but um, I have done some 
RNA-seq on the IECs from these mice uh, that are being challenged. And we have identified some of the targets based on whether we're there within those, those haploblocks. So we can take the intestinal epithelial cells out of the mouse and grow them as an enteroid monolayer in this transwell insert cell culture system. And this allows us to measure, more finely measure uh, how tight junctions are working and how intestinal permeability is dynamically. Um, so we measure tier trans epithelial electrical resistance in these monolayers. So a stronger barrier with very tight connections between the cells will have a high tier and a weak barrier will have a lower tier. So when we uh, expose these monolayers to peanut in the apical side of the compartment, which corresponds to the luminal GI um, tract, we see a decrease in tier. Um, and this is uh, reported as percent difference from the baseline tier because there is quite a bit of variation um, with it between these monolayers and their starting tier. Um, we only see this decrease in the IECs that were derived from peanut sensitized and peanut challenged mice. Um, and then when we add Fitzy dextran to the apical compartment as well and recover it from the bottom chamber, we also had an increase in the amount of Fitzy dextran that crossed the barrier only in the uh, IEC from peanut sensitized mice. Um, I was very lucky to get samples from um, a collaborator, Edwin Kim, who has done a lot of um, peanut allergy trials for immunotherapy, so sublingual immunotherapy and oral immunotherapy um, to try to help uh, patients with peanut allergy. So I was able to get um, some samples from peanut allergics. These are challenge um, confirmed peanut allergy, as well as non-peanut -aller non allergic patients to uh, start to look at maybe some um, some markers of intestinal permeability in the serum. And notably, no difference between the proportions of males and females in these groups. We didn't really have enough to, to look for differences in other atopic conditions, um, but that's something that would obviously uh, may contribute to how we interpret these data. So, um, LBP or LPS binding protein is one of the serum proteins that is, has been looked at in intestinal permeability and can be elevated when there is more intestinal permeability because doing the lactulose mannitol assays are really time consuming um, and are very expensive. So when we looked at um, the allergic versus non-allergic allergic patients, peanut allergic patients had significantly higher levels of serum LVP. And then when we looked only in the peanut allergic subjects and we stratified them by how much they were able to tolerate in their initial challenge with peanut, we saw that the patients that were able to tolerate either no or a very small amount of peanut protein had higher levels of serum LVP compared to the patients that could tolerate more. So suggesting that this could stratify patients and um, be associated with more severe reactions. Um, also this dose um, correlated very well with the serum LVP. So this first part to summarize, we identified the CC27 mouse. It's a great model for studying the effect of peanut on the gut. Um, these mice have increased IEC barrier permeability during peanut challenge, and this also persists in IEC cultures, ex vivo. Um, patients with peanut allergy have higher uh, serum levels of LVP, and those that tolerate 
lower amounts of peanut have higher levels of LBP, suggesting, again, that uh, intestinal permeability is associated with um, uh, susceptibility or, uh, or sensitivity to peanut. So the next part, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the microbiome studies we've done because I know we're a microbiome heavy group. Um, so I wanted to start by just looking at some uh, immunoglobulin studies in these mice in the stool. So this paper, which was published last year, um, was comparing CC27 and C3H mice. So C3H mice are considered a, a pro-allergy strain. So they're used in a lot of allergy studies, but in our specific model, they do not develop allergy. So when they looked at stool IgA, CC27 mice had almost undetectable IgA levels. This is, these are naive mice, so they haven't been sensitized or exposed to any food allergens. Um, when they looked at the microbial community composition, they actually saw a higher uh, Shannon entropy or Shannon diversity index, um, suggesting there were more rich microbial communities or um, a change in uh, or higher evenness between the communities. But when they looked at sort of the richness of the communities, there was no difference between the mice. So this suggests that the, the thing driving the Shannon index is the difference in abundance between the strains. So when they, uh, we looked at a PCOA plot of the different samples from each of these mice, they separated very nicely by mouse strain. Um, suggesting that there are important differences between the microbial communities in C3H and CC27 mice. Again, these are naive mice. They haven't, they don't have allergy. They're just hanging out living their lives. <laughs> if we look at the, some of the um, bacterial orders that are different, that have different abundance in each of these mice, um, we see some big differences, particularly in the aneroplasmatalis and lactobacillus orders. Um, so a really talented undergraduate, uh, or sorry, used to be a graduate student, now has graduated and moved on, um, Andrew Hinton used machine learning to try to identify some of the signature features of these communities that would define the CC27 versus the C3H communities. And he was able to identify uh, 44 different features in these mice. Um, one of the uh, differences in how he did his analysis is that he used ratios, log ratios for each of these microbial communities. So he used computational analysis to identify one kind of standardizing community within the bunch. And then he took the ratio of all the other taxa to that one community. So the idea is um, because when you do the microbiome analysis, you're always looking at relative amounts. So this way, by transforming the data, you can start to uh, compare these a little bit easier between, um, between samples. So when we take these same log uh, ratios and put them in a heat map, it's a little easier to visualize the differences between each of these samples um, by strain. So uh, the two features or the two um, taxa that showed the biggest difference uh, between the strains were these two guys, which we'll zoom in and show you here, um, are the, and I have to go way down to find the name. Um, so uh, 
So from the Aneroplasma genus, which is the top one, and then the Lachnospreciae family, which is the second one. So these are the top two taxa that were most important for classifying strain differences between these mice. Again, still naive mice. So now what happens when we sensitize them to the food? Um, so this analysis gets a little complicated when we look at the microbial communities, but the same analysis was done. So we sensitize me to different food allergens. When we look at the total fecal IgA. Again, it was still quite low in the CC27 mice as before. Um, when we look at peanut specific IgG and walnut specific IgG in the stool, CC27 mice had high levels of this, um, suggesting they're mounting an immune response to these foods. Um, and there was no increase in the stool specific IgE to milk or egg. So the, the goal of this um, study was to measure the perturbation of the microbial communities based on the food exposure. So they did this by strain and also by food protein the mice were exposed to. So essentially the perturbation is the change in the microbial communities, change in the relative abundance of a community after exposure to a food protein. Um, and so this is the analysis um, by PCOA plot showing um, the sort of where things start and where the changes are dispersed within those communities. Um, so it's a, a dissimilarity plot to show that the starting points may be different, um, but overall, when they did the analysis, the dispersion was not different, significantly different for each group. So there wasn't like a defining feature that, that different groups had identifiable changes in their, in their communities. Um, so they grouped the, um, these perturbations by similarity and came up with these five clusters. And this cluster represented 90% of the mice that developed anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction when they were challenged with their foods. Um, and so when we looked at these clusters and identified again by machine learning, some of the features that identified each cluster, um, they did this as enrichment or depletion to listeria. Um, they found three of, of these different taxa were associated with the differences between the clusters. So one was acromantia, eucinophila, the guy that likes to eat the, um, the mucus. mucus, yes, thank you. Um, Candidatus arthromedus, and then uh, bifidobacterium, which we know a little bit more about. So these uh, studies were uh, suggesting that mice that develop anaphylaxis may have specific changes in their microbiome after they're sensitized to peanut that might predict whether they'll be more, have a more severe reaction to peanut. So, okay, so uh, to summarize that part, um, naive and food sensitized CC27 mice have very low levels of stool IgA, which could certainly play a role in uh, their susceptibility to peanut allergy. Strain specific differences in microbial composition exist in night mice. And then the perturbations in these microbial compositions after food exposure identify these different taxa associated with anaphylaxis. So I think I'll probably um, sort of end with that and not go into this last part, which I'm sorry, you haven't seen this before, but I have presented this quite a few times. Um, and just go straight to acknowledgements because I have a lot of people who 
who have helped me out with these projects, um, particularly the Shane Fury Lab. Uh, Shazad's been really, really supportive in my whole journey from the T32 to uh, junior faculty. Um, and other people in the lab have been really super helpful. Uh, collaborators in Wesley Burke's lab, Johanna and Michael, um, have been a big part of this. Um, and I've gotten a lot of support from the university uh, to continue my research and be supported financially as well. Um, so it's been a great journey. I, as Shazad said, my paper is finally accepted. Um, so onward and upward. I will take any questions. People. Um, I was wondering if in the microbiome piece that you just presented, um, if it has been done or maybe even tossed around an idea to co-house the non-susceptible mice with the CC27 mice and get the microbial communities kind of the same and then sensitize and challenge and look to see if there's any differences or if you can rescue the, the effect. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so in the study I showed, mice were not co-housed. Some of the studies I've done, um, mice were co-housed together. Uh, it didn't, sh so they were different strains though. And we don't have a good way to identify these mice before we challenge them. So it's certainly possible we could like identify the responders after we challenge them and they're sensitized and then co-house them with the non-responders and see if that changes um, how they react to do that. Have you I, thought about like CMT, like a sequel microbial transfer or? Mm -hmm. We have, yeah, we have not done that, but I have plans to really delve into the microbiome part of it, trying to establish germ-free mice, where we can then introduce different microbial communities and see how that affects reaction. I guess the single microbial transfer that you'd run into issues there if you're already probably causing inflammation to the intestine by just gavaging a new, like having to deplete bacteria and then reintroduce bacteria would cause it. A response in itself, yeah. Which I think maybe you wouldn't want to challenge with allergen, but yeah. I feel like if you could change the microbial community with co-housing of the non-susceptible C, the H E J mice, yeah, the C three H E, you can reduce the allergen reaction. It's like a starting point. So in my studies where I have co-housed the mice together, they still, they still have pretty exuberant reactions. So, so I just realized like. Did we even talk about lacto in your proposal? We never did, right? No. Because there's a decrease in lacto. So simple. Like I think Balfour has all these lacto cocktails. And if you would just feed your CCO to almost like a co-housing, but you may just more therapeutic because there's no underlying chronic inflammation here. Right. Right. Um, so the, so Johanna's already done some studies with um I want to say lactobacillus with some of the nutrition folks to introduce it and see if that changes reactivity. They haven't seen any effect of the community, those communities. I mean, they did not pre-treat them with antibiotics or do anything else. So it's hard to know how much is really staying in the gut. Um, but you know, looking at specific communities and trying to deplete certain ones and see how that affects the response is definitely something that would be easier than the germ-free mice and then reconstituting. What do antibiotics do to mind me? Um, so we haven't looked at antibiotic treatment in these mice, but that's always an alternative that would be quick. I'm curious on your CC27 mice, if you guys give me no phenotype the tissues in the gut, looking for different cellular populations and what you saw. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we've done a lot of different um, immunophenotyping, mostly on the mesenteric lymph nodes and some of the spleen. Um, but in general, they have their cellularity of their lymph nodes is lower compared to normal unsensitized mice. 
Um, they have lower levels of T regulatory cells. Um, they have, I think they have more follicular T helper cells. Um, so there are differences in their immune composition and the mesenteric lymph nodes. Um, yeah, so we've, we've definitely started looking at that and seeing kind of how the recall responses are and um, try to start characterizing that. We have questions from the chat. Um, John Hansen asks, does the effect of peanut protein on transfer IEC permeability vary if the protein is placed apically or as a letter in, laterally? Yeah, I definitely want to do that. Um, that is something I haven't done yet and I'm really interested in looking at that because there could be a differential response um, and that could lead us down different pathways and exploring the mechanism. Um, so something I definitely want to do. Okay, should I unmute your little bit? Don't they unmute, can they can hear okay. with, the, with the microphones in the seat. So Johanna's asking, um, or she's making a comment that they tried acromancia and lacmose parisia after antibiotic to, after antibiotic treatment, but it seemed to make things worse. Thank you, John. Thank you. The Dr. model, do you have like an expected type of mechanism you're looking for? Like you can just do like RNA seq and see if there's receptors that are present or absent. Like so, um, I've thought about kind of the protease activated receptors because some of the proteins um, in peanut are expected to have protease activity. Um, so thinking about the PARs, I don't, well, I don't think there was a change. So when we looked um, in RNA-seq and the IECs from unsensitized versus sensitized mice, at baseline, there was like 13 differentially expressed genes. So very low, very little difference. Um, and so we suspect that you need to have some some uh, stimulation or something to perturb that system to really identify and unmask those differences. Um, but I don't remember seeing those receptors that were changed after challenge with peanut. Um, yeah. Interesting. I'm just curious, interested, so I mean, tell me to shut up. But um, do you think this is really driven by the epithelial cells directly, or do you think this is a consequence of them being more leaky and maybe your lack of Tregs that are able to dampen a response? Yeah. I'm just curious on your your thoughts. Yeah, on that. I think it's both. That's a good, true. Have you done this in rag animals? Um, so with the CC mice, oh, yeah, sorry, it's really hard. hard to get on any other background yeah. like, to do any, to use the tools we have for all of these usual mouse strains, right? So it makes it a little bit tougher. I mean, there are other ways to deplete sure. your cells and things. Um, but I suspect, so there are other things like the mast cells in these mice um, accumulate with sensitization, so they have more intestinal mast cells, which certainly could be a big part of the intestinal permeability. Um, so I do think that you kind of need both parts in this mouse to have the full allergic response. Um, that's a common question, like, isn't this just the immune system? But there's still that initial response, so the first exposure to peanut where you have sort of a mild increase in permeability, a small decrease in body temperature that suggests there's something about peanut that is having a bigger effect on the intestinal epithelium. Sure. Yeah, Audra. When you were sharing your microbiome data, I noted that there was a depletion in the Aphromantium mesenophila. Yeah. And that got me thinking, is what is known about mucus height Height in people with peanut allergy, because could 
the, the lack of mucus of the acromantia suggests that there's reduced mucus. Mm -hmm. Again, chicken and egg, but if there is reduced mucus, a mucinophilic bug isn't going to grow. Right. And the reduced mucus height might actually cause closer exposure. And that's where these yeah, independent effects of you know, might also come into play, right? Yeah. So I don't enough. think it's been studied in humans. Um, you have to <laughs> so you have to remember that this is also in the small intestine, yeah. which is different from the colon and the properties of mucins are mucus is different between the two. Uh, but it still could be really interesting to, to look at that. If you want to get a biopsies now from kids, yes. and so I think that this is right for looking at it. Mm -hmm. Stain. Just measuring height. Measuring stain. Yeah. Because it might just be as simple as like, yeah. it just, yeah, yeah. Looks like yeah, yeah, right. No, definitely. Keep the folds in the slayer and the biopsy. Yeah. Wow, that's if cool. you, we collect it with the flat biopsy folds, it's also full. That preserves a lot of the architecture. Is that what they usually use? Uh, the jaw do crushes the biopsy, especially with the research. Cool. All right. Let's <laughs> do it. Yeah. <laughs> Measure some mucus. Do people who have peanut allergy, are they also differentially susceptible to enteric pathogens that you know of? Uh, not that I know of. Um, are they colonizing yeah. type coli, enteric type coli? I don't think, thank you. I don't think anyone's looked at that or found that in microbiome studies. Usually they're looking at stools, so you're not going to necessarily see mucosal adherence. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that we've done before on uh, tissue biopsies. Um, it could be something we look at. There's also kind of a uh, inverse correlation between uh, like countries that would have more enteric pathogens I, and peanut allergy. Right? That's just the exact way we're yeah. about. That they are opposite, so it maybe at least in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. those was absolutely. Yeah. So it's kind of, I sort of think of it as like the board immune system. <laughs> like if it's not actively fighting infections so often, it kind of becomes bored and starts targeting other, yeah. right? Other things potentially. Um, so one of my colleagues, Oni Awala, is very interested in how parasitic infections um, affect allergies downstream and responses to vaccines and things. So. She would be someone to talk about if you're interested in that. My turn.